Uh, I'm also a student of history. And uh, I love this slide because this is a picture of the two people facing the camera are Inuit women. This is a photograph taken on the Arctic tundra uh, in uh, northern Canada. Uh, it was taken about 1910. You can see by their clothing and everything, these are people who are following their uh, Aboriginal lifestyle um, with a few exceptions. If you look really closely right here, this is a double-barreled shotgun, um, which wasn't a, a handmade native in, uh, hunting instrument. Uh, but, tip, but the thing they didn't have is they hadn't been educated. They don't have notebooks and paper. And what we don't have is we don't have any written records of what their dietary guidelines were. Um, uh, we have anecdotes from, from people who watched them and lived among them, um, uh, but the records are sparse, and I want to try to drag a little bit out of this because there are a couple things I think they could have told us. For instance, when they brought their fox pelts into camp, they'd hunted them, or, or into the trading post, they'd hunt them all winter long when the pelts were rich and thick, and they'd, they'd bring these pelts in, they'd trade them for things like shotguns and tea and tobacco and sugar and flour. And the anecdotes, there was a book written by a French explorer, the name was Kabluna, which is the Inuit name for white guys. And um, this explorer mentioned that when they came into camp and they traded all this stuff, and then they took the sugar and flour and stuff and they loaded it on their sleds, and they'd go about five miles out of, outside the, from the trading post, and then they set up their camp, and they spend a week or two there eating all the food. And they thought that was really intemperate of these people. You know, they're eating all this, this food, they should make it last over the course of the year. And he said, and they were really slothful. And then they'd pack up and leave. And I think what happened was they did the carbs, which tasted good, and it was, you know, kabluna food. And then they would get, spend a week or two getting over having eaten, and then they go back to their lifestyle, which was really physically challenging. So I think that, you know, I'm, try, I'm trying to reverse, reverse engineer, but I think that was the first example we, that I can find in the literature, well, one of the first examples of keto adaptation, which is one of the key things I want to talk about in my segment of this talk. Um, now, this is a pastel um, a diag or a, a picture that was drawn and published in the um, 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 a journal of an Arctic explorer named Frederick Swatka. And Swatka went into the Arctic in the late 1870s, and he wanted to find a way to get up to the Arctic Ocean uh, from the western shore of, of um, Hudson Bay and find out what happened to a Royal Navy expedition with 129 men and two ships that disappeared in the Arctic in the 1840s and was never heard from again, and no one had figured out what, what fate became of these people. So rather than take and load up sleds or take boats and try to drag them into the Arctic to find out, which is what other people had done in many art expeditions trying to figure out what happened to the Franklin expedition to come to grief. He decided, I'll just hire a couple of Inuit families and I'll let them take me there. Uh, and that's what they did. And you can see he, whoop, wrong button. He does have paper and pencil and they're writing stuff down. And he kept a journal of that experience. Um, they traveled 3,000 miles um, uh, in uh, about 13 months. They found artifacts and evidence of <clears throat> where this expedition came to grief. Um, but in his journal, he wrote a really fascinating line. Now, I'll, let me put this in context. Um, I discovered this in the spring of 1980. I just finished doing my study on bike racers, and I was trying to write it up, and um, I thought I'd come up with the idea of keto adaptation. And, then I come upon this, this uh, thing where he says, when first thrown wholly upon the diet of reindeer meat, by which he means caribou, which is what they hunted in the winter when they were inland, it seems inadequate to properly nourish the system, and there is an apparent weakness and inability to perform severe exertive journeys. But this soon passes away in the course of two or three weeks. And what that means is this guy scooped me by 100 years. <laughs> um, but he didn't write down what they ate. He just said that, you know, they... They didn't take enough supplies with them to have you know, sugar and, and, and carbohydrate for more than the first few weeks. And after that, for that 13 months, they lived off the land and there were no fields of waving grain. Um, and, but then uh, this other Arctic explorer, a very controversial person named uh, uh, Wilhelm Stefansson, 
uh, who was trained in what we would now call anthropology at Harvard, uh, was fascinated by the Inuit peoples. Uh, by his name, you can tell he's of Icelandic origin, but he was born in Canada. And he was interested in First Nations and Inuit uh, uh, lifestyles and so on. So he went into the north of Canada and spent the better part of 10 years living among the Inuit. Um, uh, he uh, and ended up being put in a compromising situation where he didn't have any food or, or um, uh, um, sustenance for a winter, and so we actually had to move in with this group of Inuit, and when spring emerged, you know, the winter's there last nine months, uh, he spoke their language and understood their culture enough that he could live that lifestyle, and he did that for prolonged periods of time. He wrote about it in both scientific papers and in books, um, and among those things, he said, I could live on a diet of meat and fat without any vegetable matter for two years at a time, and I wouldn't get sick. Now, if you look at the timing between 1914 and 1927 was when all the vitamins were found, some of which, like ascorbate, are said to be only found in a significant quantity in vegetable matter. The people who read his writings, who knew nutrition, who understood the science of nutrition, knew he was lying, because you get scurvy within three or four months if you eat a diet without any vitamin C in it, right? So he was called a liar. He allowed himself to be locked up in Bellevue Hospital, then is now in New York City, is a place for insane people. But it was also a place where some where early um, uh, scientists had set up a, basically a metabolic research facility. And he was incarcerated. I think, Gary, you corrected me. He was only in there for like five months. And then they let him out on parole, basically, as long as he came in every day to be checked up on. Uh, and he and another um, of his Ar Arctic explorer colleagues spent a year living on a diet of meat and fat, and they did not develop scurvy. And they didn't lose weight. And they, as, they didn't do formal performance testing, but they would take them out, escorted, and let them walk or jog through Central Park, and, and they so showed no evidence of impaired function. Um, uh, and uh, in his book, Stefanson did not give you gram weights or macros for what the diet that he had learned to eat in the Arctic. But luckily, doctors Walter McClellan and Eugene Dubois did write down what these guys ate in their uh, uh, multiple months of incarceration and then tracking their diet as outpatients. And what, he ate, what they ate was roughly about uh, 15 to 20 percent of daily energy requirement is protein, over 200 grams of fat per day, which is, represents 80 percent or more. And the only carbohydrate they got was from the glycogen that was in the meat of the animals when they were slaughtered. And as, as uh, Dr. Noakes and, and uh, the people who wrote The Real Meal Revolution point out, they ate nose to tail. They weren't just eating you know, fancy cuts of stuff. Uh, because there are different nutrients in different parts of the body and in different different uh, animal sources. Um, and so I looked at that uh, uh, data and I said, well, that, that if, if these guys are trying to um, prove that you can live on a diet of meat and fat, they, they would be trying to emulate what they did in the Arctic because they didn't want to get scurvy and they didn't want to prove McClellan and Newbar right. Um, so to me, that's the best uh, I could come up with of what, was, what represented an Inuit diet. Uh, but Stefanson was and remained very controversial, even though this was published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry in 1930. Uh, and uh, I met people in the 1960s and 70s who told me he couldn't believe anything he said because the guy was obviously a liar. And those are scientific people <laughs> in, in the metabolism community. Um, uh, and I want to realize this is a very busy looking slide, but I want to share this with you because this is where I identify the origins of carbohydrate loading. And this was a uh, paper published in the Scandinavian uh, journal, Scandinavian Archives of Physiology in 1939. The title, it was in German, the title of it is, and I'll slaughter this probably, is Arbeitsfähigkeit und Ernährung, which I believe maybe Dr. Lechner in the audience can correct me, but I think it means uh, work capability and nutrition. And this is a study done of three subjects. Um, and they had three arms of a study, and each of them, uh, each of the three subjects went on either a high carbohydrate, low fat diet, their normal diet, or a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. And I want to, I put this stuff up here because I want to point out that f this is the um, high fat diet, so fat diet. Um, and if you look at the, the calories over here from, uh, of, of fat, um, that, uh, and that's, this is, uh, you can see that, that there's very modest amounts of protein. So there's 21 grams of protein, I'm sorry, 21 grams of protein, 
576 grams of fat, not the 200 that Stefanson was, was reported to have, and he was eating 5,000 calories. Um, so this is an extremely high-fat, hypercaloric diet that they were feeding. So this wasn't patterned after an Inuit diet. Um, and uh, what they did was they had people eat, their subjects eat these, these three diets for seven days each. And the reason they picked seven days for, to eat the diet was they had them do it for three days, and it, it appeared to be too short a period of time for adaptation. So they figured seven days would be a good period of adaptation. And when they did that, um, and then they had them do exercise on a cycle ergometer, and that exercise was about 175 watts. Whoop. 175 watts, which is a pretty, pretty good level of exercise uh, for, for anything other than a professional athlete. And they looked at their endurance time to exhaustion, and the, on the high-fat diet, they went just a little over an hour and then quit. On the normal diet, they didn't push them to exhaustion, but they went longer on the normal diet. And then on the high carbohydrate diet, you can see the to go into exhaustion, the, the duration of exercise was dramatically longer. Um, and so uh, their conclusion, and, and the other two subjects, this is just one subject, the other two subjects had patterns that were very similar. And the other thing I'll point out to you, by the way, is one of the um, uh, co-authors here is O. Hansen, Uva Hansen, and if you look at this subject, uh, this subject is subject O. H. And so this is actually self-experimentation. Um, this it was not uncommon then as now that people do self-experimentation. Um, so I was got interested in this topic. I read these things after I got interested in this. And I got interested because, in as you, uh, as Gary pointed out, in 1972, Atkins wrote a book called. Um, uh, you know, the Atkins diet and, or the uh, Atkins revolution, whatever, uh, and said that people would have a lot of energy when they went on a, on a, a very low carbohydrate, high fat, high protein diet. Um, and I knew that was wrong because my, from my own personal biking experience, if I didn't start eating carbs after the first hour and I was trying to ride up and down mountains, I would uh, uh, hit the wall within two hours. Uh, so I set out to prove Bob Atkins wrong. I'm working with my mentors, Ethan Sims and Ed Horton in Vermont, had the opportunity to do a study. So we took a group of overweight people who wanted to lose weight, and so we made a bargain with them. We'd lock them up in a metabolic research ward for seven, uh, for seven weeks. We'd give them a high-carbohydrate diet for one week and then exercise them and do muscle biopsies on them to find out what their endurance time was. And then we would put them onto a, uh, not a high fat, but a very low carbohydrate, very low calorie ketogenic diet uh, for six weeks. Uh, and when we exercised them after one week and six weeks, uh, 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 we compensated for their weight loss by having them wear a backpack which contained all the weight they lost. So we tried to compensate for their roughly 25 pounds weight loss on average at the end of, of um, the six weeks. Um, and we had them no, do no endurance training during this, this uh, exercise or during this, this weight loss diet period. Um, and what we found at one week was exactly what um, Christensen and Hansen found, and that was compared to baseline, there was a significant truncation in their endurance time to subjective exhaustion after one week. But after six weeks, and we shouldn't have done that, we should have stopped at one week, because then my career trajectory would have been very, very different. But after six weeks, when you put them back on the treadmill wearing the backpack, you can see that they went dramatically longer. And we were uh, mortified. <laughs> we could explain part of that because in spite of the fact they're wearing the backpack, the backpack with the weight, their exercise performance or their, their um, relevant percent of VO2 max dropped from about 60 to 65% down to, to 57%. So all of them became more efficient on the treadmill, even though they hadn't trained during this period of time. But our conclusion was that there was a, some recovery process that was occurring, and even though the, rel the, the relative intensity of performance dropped slightly, uh, this looked like there was some significant recovery of endurance time to exhaustion. Um, but the problem was, A, these were untrained people. They did not know what exhaustion was. Um, uh, and the, the second problem was that there was weight loss was compounding the, this. So we wanted to find a way to put people on a diet who have them in ketosis and not lose weight. 
Uh, and so this is when I read the, the, the 1929 or 1930 paper from the, the Stefanson experiment. And so we adopted a diet that was essentially the same as a Stefanson diet. Uh, and we recruited a group of bike racers. And you know, these guys will eat you know, ham sandwiches climbing up mountainsides on, on bicycles. You know, they have cast iron stomachs. So we figured we could get them to eat this. You know? they, they could eat 80% fat. And indeed, we worked out a way that they could actually do that and, and tolerate that. Uh, unfortunately, I was a beggar. I didn't have a big grant. This was a metabolic research uh, ward study, and so I had to beg for the rooms. And the longest I could get justify keeping any, any patient, any of my subjects in in the metabolic ward was four weeks. So we we picked the four week time point, not six weeks, because of you know just the, the reality, financial realities of uh, being able to make use of the limited time available in the metabolic research ward. Um, uh, and this is a lousy way to show the data, but what I show here is that VO2 max along the top line, which is five liters per minute on a cycle ergometer, by the way, which is a quite prodigious VO2 max, um, didn't change after four weeks of the ketogenic diet. Uh, when we had them exercise to exhaustion, they went 147 minutes at baseline, 151 after the four weeks of adaptation. Those numbers aren't different, so unlike the the um, uh, obese, untrained people, there was no difference in their endurance time to exhaustion. But if you look at what happened to fuel use, this is the respiratory quotient, 0.85 or 0.83 means they're burning a, a little bit more fat than carbohydrate, but about close to a 50-50 mixture. But after just four weeks of adaptation, their RQ dropped down to almost 0.70, which would be almost all fat. So this is 90% or more energy coming from fat. Add an exercise intensity of 65%, which is over three liters of oxygen consumption per minute, translates to over 900 calories of energy expenditure per hour. Uh, this is a much better slide with most of the same data. It was made by Jeff Volek, and he's much better at, at depicting things than I do. And the key thing on this slide, and, and Professor Noak showed you this on his slide, and that is these are the times for each individual subject, and you see that um, uh, one person was about the same after the four weeks of keto adaptation. Uh, two people went up and two people went down. And I've been kind of criticized for, for publishing this data because you, how can you draw any conclusions about the average person's response to this? And my point is that people vary one from another. And it may not be that, it may be that these people biologically are just not designed to function on a high fat diet. Or the alternative is these two people here required a lot longer period of time to keto adapt, because we only had four weeks. And essentially all the other studies that have been done, including Louise Burke's studies, and she knows about this concern, and <laughs> she runs studies that are three weeks duration. Um, uh, so the question is, how long does it take to keto adapt? And this will be my last slide, and that's, this is, my best biomarker for metabolic adaptation to a low-carb diet is not changing RQ, it's not the ketones coming up and stabilizing, it's the fact that renal handling of organic acids is very important for acid-based balance in the body and metabolic balance. And when you take a person and put them on a ketogenic diet and they have two to three millimolar circulating ketones, those ketones are an organic acid, and they it compete with other organic acids in the body for excretion, and the one that we usually test and, and are concerned about because of its, its participation in the cause of gout is uric acid. And uric acid, if you, and this is data compiled from a bunch of studies that I have done over time, and I'm not gonna bore you with the raw data, but typically a normal uric acid level is in the, the, the four to seven range, and when you put somebody on a ketogenic diet, they'll double their uric acid in the first week. And that's not because they make twice as much of it. It's because they're not excreting it because competition from the ketones. But if ketones stay constant and you follow uric acid over the course of nine to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, 12 weeks, they finally come back down, which means that's the duration of time in which the body uh, can, at least in the kidney, can adapt for um, acid-based balance. And so if I had to look at a minimum number for keto adaptation now, it would be in the range of nine to 12 weeks, not the, um, the two weeks or four weeks or one weeks that have got uh, uh, true in most other studies. And with that, I'll turn this over to Jeff and let him tell you about the modern science. Thank you. <laughs> 